Good evening. This is Melinda Herring from the Atlantic Council. I'm the Deputy Director of the Eurasia Center, and I'm so pleased that you've joined us for a conversation with Oliver Bolo from London. He's the author of a fantastic book, Moneyland, the inside story of the crooks and kleptocrats who rule the world. And he's going to show us a copy of that book. Here it is. Oliver, thank you so much for joining us. We're in the UK. It looks like that. Fantastic. And we're also joined by Dr. Anders Austin, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, and Diane Francis, a phenomenal writer, senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, and an expert on white collar crime. And she's also written four books on the subject. So we have an hour together, and here's how we're going to use our time. Oliver's going to give us an overview of his book and tell us some really enticing stories. And then we're going to have a discussion with Oliver, Anders, and Diane, and then we'll be pleased to take your questions. If you'd like to tweet at us, please tweet at us at, at AC Eurasia, or you can type the questions in the Q&A button if you're in Zoom with us. So Oliver, please tell us about your book and tell us where is Moneyland and how did you come up with this concept? Take it away, Oliver. Well, I'm going to say I'm really pleased to be here. I'm, I'm, to be honest, I'm pleased to be anywhere apart from um, in my living room at the moment. And I have this currently this idea that actually I'm in D.C. Um, talking to all of you wonderful people. So thanks very much for the invitation and thanks for all of you who are who are listening. Um, we None of us can really go anywhere at the moment. Um, we can't go to any actual countries. Um, and so in, in that way, you know, during this peculiar time, Moneyland is actually quite typical because we can't really go there either because none of us are um, sufficiently wealthy or powerful, I'm guessing, unless they're Vladimir Putin or someone is watching this, which is unlikely, but I suppose possible, um, that none of us can really go to Moneyland uh, at any time. So this is just, you know, an ordinary time for, for Moneyland. And I thought I would begin <clears throat> by just talking a little bit about um, where Moneyland is, or rather, where you can get a sense of what Moneyland is. Um, and you can do this in lots of places. Some of them are frankly quite boring, but I thought I'd start with one that's quite fun, which is what you get if you get on the ferry uh, in Basseterre, which is the capital of St. Kitts and Nevis, a two island federation in the Caribbean. Um, you get on the ferry in Basseterre and it, it, you know, maybe be 50, 60, 70 other people on the ferry. And it, and it goes down uh, towards the south um, west until uh, you you pass out of the the sheltered waters of ne of St Kitts and cross a na narrow channel and you arrive at a I mean, what I think I call in the book a nipple. Um, uh, it looks like a nipple. It's not a very elegant description, but it's very much what it looks like a nipple, a green tree coloured nipple, which is Nevis. Uh, Nevis is the other half of St Kitts and Nevis. It is a, um, a small island with just ten or eleven thousand inhabitants. Um, but it features regularly in some of the most egregious financial crimes in the world. And if you've spent any time looking at these financial crimes, which is kind of what I do because I'm a nerd like that, um, then going to Nevis is a really peculiar experience because there are these addresses that come up again and again and again, just, you know, street addresses that you, you'll find a shell company, some financial crime, and the trail goes dead in a shell company in Nevis, and it will be registered in a lawyer's chambers. And you get to Nevis and there it is. And then the next door building is one of the other addresses, you know, and it's, you know, the capital of Nevis, Charlestown is tiny. It's a, it's a village really. Um, but it seems like an area about the size of a football field. Every single building in there pretty much is connected in some way or other to financial crime. Um, and I mean, just to run through what some of those, you know, financial crimes were, um, the flash crash, um, the, the, the most remarkable sort of five minute drop in the Dow index um, what was it, four years ago now, the, the man who did that, Nevander Sorrell, British day trader, he had his companies registered in Nevis. There was a massive securities fraud out of New York in 2015, registered in Nevis. Um, a truly monumental scam out of Kansas City, which stole $161 million from ordinary Americans. That was registered out of Nevis. International corruption, uh, Nigerian politicians, Taiwanese politicians, uh, Azerbaijani politicians, uh, Ukrainian politicians. Maybe we'll get a bit more to Ukraine later, um, when right-wing trolls tried to make Emmanuel Macron look corrupt when he was uh, seeking election in 2017, how did they do it? They invented a shell company in Nevis. It is so synonymous with corruption and with hiding dirty money that, that essentially you now blacken a politician by inventing a shell company in Nevis. Um, but the weird thing about it is if you spend your time, as I do, reading these court cases, reading researching these crimes is when you go there you essentially you find nothing there is no one to talk to 
Um, in one particular case, I went looking for the address where a shell company was registered. I couldn't even find the address and could find no one prepared to tell me where the address was. I interviewed the the regulator of companies there. She wouldn't tell me anything at all. When I suggested Nevis was connected to financial crime, she literally laughed at me. Um, you know, there is nothing to find there. And that is what's so amazing about a place like Nevis and why it ties into what I call Moneyland. Because Nevis is an island surrounded, obviously, by water, like all islands, but it's a particularly remote one. And it doesn't really have anything to sell. Yes, it's got nice beaches, so it's a good place to go on holiday. But so are a lot of places in the Caribbean, and a lot of places in the Caribbean are a lot easier to get to. So it looked around for what it has to sell. And once it's got past tourism, what else does it have to sell? What does anyone have to sell? Any country, essentially, when you get down to it, can sell its sovereignty. And that's what Nevis did. Almost immediately after St. Kitts and Nevis became independent in the 1980s, um, it contracted with an American lawyer, a guy called Bill Barnard, to create essentially uh, a, a shell company, a, a, an extraordinarily opaque shell company that could be used to hide assets via Nevis. And he created them and he sold them. He had the exclusive right to sell them. So it was a joint venture between an American lawyer and this jurisdiction, Nevis, which is, though part of a federation, is sovereign, so it has the right to do what it likes for itself. Um, and, and with time, uh, Nevis has, has, has built on that original innovation. It has brought in more American lawyers from, from different places, a lot of them from Florida, to improve its laws, to bring in trust laws, to bring in all, all sorts of extraordinarily opaque innovations to prevent anyone finding out the owner of property registered on Nevis. And it's quite profitable. You know, it's not, um, you know, it doesn't have a, that huge a corporate registry by the standards of, say, the British Virgin Islands. But, you know, 18,000 companies for a place with only 11,000 people, you know, that a little goes a long way in, in, a, in a place like that. And it's been a, a tidy little earner for the jurisdiction pretty much ever since. You know, so what is so what does this mean? What is Moneyland? Well, the thing is that I talk about Nevis, but as I said at the beginning, I could talk about dozens of other places. There are dozens of jurisdictions just like Nevis that have made the same calculation that they don't really have any way of making a living. So what they're going to sell is protection to rich and powerful people elsewhere. They are selling them the protection of their sovereignty. You could write, do this about uh, Delaware. I could talk about Jersey, I could talk about Switzerland, Monaco, Luxembourg, Liechtenstein, Singapore, Hong Kong. South Dakota now is doing very well out of this kind of business. If you are looking to make a living and can't think of a better way to do it, then essentially allowing people to register their assets via your jurisdiction and allowing them to hide, the, hide them there is actually quite a profitable way of making a living, if you don't mind the inevitable moral um, sort of consequences of doing so. Um, it, it mutates all the time. Um, you know, all these jurisdictions are constantly competing with each other for who can hide assets better, which means that you can always hide assets deeper and further. One of the reasons that South Dakota has done so well recently is because Switzerland got rather knocked out of the game after the financial crisis, having been the leading jurisdiction for decades. And South Dakota has stepped in and, and taken up the slack. Um, and it, it's a process whereby if you are rich enough and powerful enough to afford the fees charged by lawyers and accountants in places like Nevis or South Dakota or Luxembourg or indeed the city of London, then um, you can buy yourself protection from disclosure or protection from taxation that ordinary people like me and I'm suspecting almost everyone else watching this um, has to face. It means that there is a, a one lot of rules for ordinary people and another lot of rules for everyone else, the, the, the wealthy and the powerful. And that's what I call Moneyland. Moneyland is essentially a portmanteau country that is made up of all the laws that are most convenient to anyone rich and powerful at any moment in time. You can choose. Moneyland is a, is a pick and mix of a country. Choose whatever laws you want to live by, and those are the laws you will live by. And so is this bad? I mean, I think so. Personally, I think it's, it's a disastrous uh, uh, way of, of running the world. It allows kleptocrats to steal money and hide it and have essentially face no consequences, get away with their theft. Viktor Yanukovych uh, of Ukraine, who, who's, who's um, downfall in 2014, started me on this trail of looking into dirty money. You know, he hid his money in not just in Nevis, but all over the world. Um, and that money has essentially not been found. 
not only has his money not been found, but but a previous kleptocrat from Ukraine from 20 years previously, Pavlo Lazarenko, his money has still not been recovered, despite the fact that he was convicted and jailed in the United States. His money was so well hidden that it still hasn't been consequent, um, hasn't been confiscated. Um, this system, the money land system, allows big corporations to avoid taxes, uh, avoid taxes extremely successfully, which gives them an unfair advantage over their smaller competitors because smaller competitors have to pay tax. I think that's bad too. And I think particularly relevantly at the moment, um, it undermines the ability of states to tackle uh, urgent threats and to tackle um, and to build the preparedness that's required to tackle threats like COVID-19. Um, if we look at, uh, say, a country like Venezuela, which is, you know, a, a a perfect expression of a kleptocracy, really. You know, that country has, you know, it's essentially a sitting duck. There is almost no healthcare system left. The um, the local Academy of Sciences has warned that the, that the country is desperately vulnerable to, um, to uh, COVID-19 because all the money that was supposed to have spent in hospitals and so on has been stolen. And instead of going to spend on healthcare has been spent on top, top notch real estate in Miami or, or Madrid. Um, that's where the money goes. We see the same situation in Ukraine, also vulnerable to COVID because the money's been stolen and spent in London. Um, Nigeria, you know, has 200 million population, fewer than 200 ventilators for the entire country. Um, this is desperately vulnerable for when the virus hits them. And the reason it's so vulnerable is the money that should have been spent on building up the healthcare has been stolen, has been hidden offshore, so it's totally un unfindable, is, is hidden so well that it can never be recovered and is spent on, on fine art, on real estate, on, on luxury goods in places like London, places like New York and places like Madrid. And this is the, the real damage that Moneyland does, the Moneyland system, is it makes it so easy to steal that there is essentially no reason not to steal. You'd be The only reason not to steal if you're running a country like Ukraine is because you don't want to. You're never going to get caught. And if you do get caught, you're always going to get away with it because no one is going to be able to confiscate the money or, or find the money back. So that's the problem with Moneyland, is it's a it's a, it's a it's a big giant jackpot for anyone in power to use their power to steal money and that's why i think it's something we really need to do something about thank you thank you so much if you're just joining us we're here with oliver bolo he's the author of moneyland the inside story of the crooks and kleptocrats who rule the world it was published in 2018 and it's available on amazon.com so i want to bring anders and diane into the discussion anders how bad is the problem Oliver points to an estimate by the IMF that says that two to five cents of every dollar is earned illegally, which would come to about 2.6 trillion annually. But that's a guess. What, what's your best guess? Well, uh, the, our assessments by this, the best are probably done by Professor Gabriel Zachman at the uh, University of California in the Berkeley. And uh, uh, the total amount of the money we are discussing is something like eight trillion dollars. If you take this uh, higher number, it's money going in and out, so it's not uh, uh, a stock. Then you get uh, a different kind of, of a number. But uh, let me give you a few uh, illustrations. The Russian money abroad, private money, is eight hundred billion to one trillion dollars, and this we can see from the Russian official uh, uh, account how much money that has gone out of the country. There are people who assess that it, it, it's more, but it's certainly not uh, less. Uh, the big country uh, that uh, has um, anonymous com uh, companies uh, that invest in the United States is Cayman Island, a little island with 60,000 uh, souls, but it has uh, $1.7 trillion of uh, investment in US securities. So Cayman Island is the second biggest investor in US securities be uh, before China, but after uh, uh, Japan. So this is the kind of money we are talking about. Gabriel Sachsman, whom I just mentioned, he assesses that 8% of uh, all wealth is hidden in offshore uh, havens. And uh, the two biggest offshore havens are the United States of America and the United Kingdom. This is where the money is hidden. So a fair guess is that uh, $400 billion or so of Russian private money is in this country and perhaps $200 billion in London. I'm just guessing. But uh, these are 
the, the kind of a dimension we are talking about. And then you wonder how is it possible? Oliver just uh, mentioned it uh, through anonymous companies. The United States has more than 2 million anonymous companies. And uh, uh, Wilmington, Delaware produces each year about 200,000 anonymous companies now. So this is a massive uh, a factory of anonymous uh, uh, companies and you get away with it. So the typical money from Russia, it goes from Moscow through a state bank to previously through, to, uh, through Cyprus, now through several other uh, channels, then to British Virgin Islands and then to Cayman Islands. In each place, you get uh, half a dozen of uh, uh, anonymous companies, shell companies, that are then uh, put into Delaware, the, where you get uh, another dozen, half a dozen of shell companies, or through various ways into, uh, into uh, to, to Britain. It doesn't stay on the small islands because they are far too small. It needs big, deep financial markets. There are three... Uh, criteria that, that are needed. First, it is anonymous ownership. Second, good rule of law. And thirdly, deep financial markets. And it's really only the US and the UK that fully qualify uh, for this. One, there's a little bit of a money spread. But let me say that this is really an excellent book that uh, Oliver has written. And this is a vital issue that is little no. Why is it little known? Because it's difficult to write about it for two reasons. One is that it's rather technical, and Oliver has managed to do it in a very nice narrative so that uh, it becomes visible how it functions. And the other is that you usually get sued if you write such a book because of a very tough uh, US and UK libel laws. And the people behind it are the law firm, firm that are representing uh, the criminals. So I see the worst enablers uh, to be the law firm. And of course, I'm not naming anybody because they would sue me instantly. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. you. Thank you, Anders. I, I share your admiration for, for Oliver's book. I really enjoyed the particular passages when you were trying to explain shell companies and you admitted to being completely overwhelmed by how complicated it was. It, it's a fabulous book. Diane, let me bring you in here. Oliver rightly says that confronting Moneyland is not easy. Where do we start? Well, I think, it, again, I, I agree. It's, I'm glad this book has been written and we need lots more written to, to get it get the, the message across. Um, there, there are really three uh, areas that are separate. There's the kleptocracies, the corrupt officials who hide their ill-gotten gains all over the world and buy real estate with it or whatever they do. Um, there's the tax evaders, and those uh, those would be the people that indulge in what what's known as under and under under and over invoicing, and that is billions of dollars a year. These are people that overcharge someone for goods and services, undercharge someone for goods and services, and that person keeps the money in the other country, and so they they remove the taxation from the cut. It's very complicated. That's tax evaders, and that's also husbands trying to hide money from their ex-wives. Uh, and then the biggest one of all is organized crime, and they invented all of this. I mean, let's not forget Meyer Lansky, Al Capone. These were guys who made huge fortunes illegally and had to hide the proceeds and didn't like paying taxes either. So they invented the laundry. They invented, they turned laundromats, they turned casinos, horse tracks, they turned the whole island of Cuba into a gigantic laundry. And then when Cuba was shut down by by uh, by by Castro, then the 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 action shifted to the Caribbean, particularly the Bahamas. Then that was shut down after a big scandal. So this has gone on for decades, and I think it's really it's it's really so pervasive. And the the main culprits are the banks were the main culprits, but actually the world has kind of cleaned up the banks. You can't walk into a bank any longer with a suitcase full of cash unless it's your bank. And even then you're regulated and there's forms you have to fill in if a certain amount of cash is involved. Cash is important because it's the easiest way to get drug proceeds and other kinds of illegal proceeds out. Um, but we cleaned up the banks, but we didn't clean up 
the legal firms. And so the legal firms have just been able to bypass the banking controls in the good countries and just created all kinds of not only anon anonymous companies, but trusts in in Swiss uh, in Swiss office offices 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 and shell companies that own shell companies. In other words, they put about ten borders between the crime and where the proceeds are, and it makes it impossible for law enforcement to either investigate it or expose it and get at it. And so this is the whole game. And I think it starts with the legal profession. And in Canada, we have tried to bridle the legal profession. Britain has done something and Australia better than others so far, but I'm sure it's spotty. And that is basically, they have to attack, you have to attack the issue of client confidentiality that lawyers hide crooks behind. And the reason why client confidentiality is the biggest problem in terms of unraveling this issue is because it allows not only them to hide it, but they use their trust funds to get the money through legal bank accounts and the legal companies' bank accounts that are not regulated. The cash flows and it goes right into real estate or whatever. And this is very tricky because the lawyers will argue, well, that's the basis of that's the basis of protection and the rule of law. Well, it, it really isn't. So what they've done in Britain to a certain extent and in Australia they've done, we couldn't, we haven't been able to do in Canada, is that you you make you make it a requirement that a lawyer has to note to authorities suspicious clients and suspicious transactions of any amount, cash or otherwise. And once you do that, then you start to stop that as a conduit. But again, it's it's a real problem. And the figure that I've heard to add to what Anders said is that there's about thirty-two trillion dollars of dirty money hidden all over the world in real assets or in financial assets, 32 trillion and counting. And that would include mafias, kleptocrats, tax evaders, and, and so on. It's, 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 it's frightening. And the US economy is 22 trillion by comparison. Wow, that, that, that's just, that, that's just jaw dropping. Anders, I wanted to pose the same question to you. Do you have any additional thoughts uh, where, where we start on confronting Moneyland? I mean, the, the absolute condition is uh, transparency, transparency, transparency. And actually, a lot has been done. Uh, as you have heard already, essentially all the places we have mentioned uh, are countries that have Anglo-American law. In most places in Europe, you can't hide money uh, because uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, anonymous companies are not allowed. And the European Union has adopted five anti-money laundering directives. And the latest, uh, the fifth one from uh, uh, June 2018, uh, requires all members of the European Union to establish uh, public registries of all companies and the, the ultimate beneficiary owners. This is a tremendous weapon. And uh, of course, it has to be fully implemented, but this is a very strong uh, uh, weapon. And uh, my concern here is Britain. If Britain will really comply with this when uh, Brexit uh, takes place. So my worry is that Brexit will make uh, Britain uh, a major haven of dirty money. And I understand that is uh, the theme of uh, Oliver's uh, next book, even if he would uh, formulate it slightly different. And then we have, of course, the US. So uh, the House of Representatives uh, last October adopted with a big bipartisan majority, the uh, Corporate Transparency Act of uh, uh, 2019. The Senate Banking Committee is now considering the uh, Illicit Cash Act, uh, the, uh, the draft law of uh, more than 100 uh, pages. It has uh, four Republican and four uh, Democratic co-sponsors and is supported by the Republican uh, chairman of the banking uh, committee. This could go through any day and that would uh, could lead to the US uh, uh, really cleaning up the uh, 
the anonymous uh, company uh, sector. It would be a tremendous uh, uh, blow. And uh, there are many Republicans uh, and virtually all Democrats who are in favor of uh, this legislation. The US legislation would not call for a public registry as in the European Union, but uh, for uh, all ultimate beneficiary owners being registered in FinCEN the financial police of uh, the, the US uh, Treasury. So this essentially would do, would do the trick. And there's a big movement among uh, NGOs uh, here in the US uh, uh, to push uh, this through. And it's interesting, as uh, Diane mentioned, the banks have been cleaned up. And they were cleaned up by the, the Patriot Act of 2001 that essentially cleaned out shell banks throughout the world. And we need to go ahead and do so. The U.S. laws have a tremendous impact because almost two thirds of all transactions in the world are made in U.S. dollars. And that means that each dollar passes through New York, which means that the U.S. has jurisdiction over all transactions in the U.S. dollars. And it's well implemented also because it goes through the three big money banks in New York, J.P. Morgan, City Bank of New York, uh, uh, Mellon. And these banks are very cautious to register everything because they don't want to pay more fines. The U.S. banks in 2008 have paid $350 billion uh, in fines. So the, the big bank is led by uh, Gemma Diamond of uh, J.P. Morgan said, we have paid enough fines. We are not going to do this any longer. So they spend now several billion dollars a year on compliance. How can they reduce this cost? By uh, insisting on uh, transparent ownership. So the banks have now turned around and become the leaders in the fight for transparent ownership. And you wonder who are the real crooks? Of course, the lawyers. The lawyers are the ones who are fighting against the uh, uh, transparent ownership. Thank you, Andres. Oliver, how do we incentivize what you call the enablers, the lawyers, the accountants, the financial whizzes to avoid this line of work? It's a real challenge because, I mean, essentially, it's a very profitable line of work, right? Um, you know, being a mob banker is a profitable way to be being a mob lawyer is a profitable way to be being a kleptocrats banker or a kleptocrats lawyer even more profitable i mean this is a you know most lawyers most accountants most bankers are perfectly nice people who do you know i'm sure very honest and above board work but those that don't do exceptionally well out of it so how do you change that calculation because if you just try and work in a in a moral suasion way you know, and a few people will get out of the business, but that just means the ones that are left will make even more profits. Um, I'm in, fully in favor of sending people to jail. I think this is one thing that the US is very good at and the, the European Union, and I'm including Britain in that, even though we're no longer in the EU, is very bad at. The Americans are very good at sending people to jail for white collar offenses. In the European Union, we, we just don't really do it. It's, enforcement is very bad on this side of the Atlantic. I think we're, we're good. Uh, the EU countries are doing well on, on, as Anders said, on transparency, moving ahead. I mean, you know, even uh, the the really notorious British offshore, offshore territories that Anders mentioned, the Cayman um, and BVI and obviously uh, Anguilla and other ones as well, uh, Gibraltar, um, uh, you know, which have been pretty shocking over the years. These, are, these aren't the fortresses of secrecy that they were. Um, they've been forced to open up and, and Parliament passed a law last year that means they're all going to have to open up their corporate registries as well. So, so transparency is moving ahead, you know, not everywhere. You know, obviously, you know, Panama remains a problem. Kitson Nevis is a problem. Vanuatu is a problem. But, they're, you know, these are increasingly isolated outposts. It's, it's not as mainstream as it used to be to be uh, a secrecy haven. But the, the, for me, the new frontier is trying to persuade law enforcement agencies to take these crimes seriously and to try and um, persuade governments to properly resource their law enforcement agencies so they can take these crimes seriously. And this isn't as easy as it sounds because, you know, most of these frauds, um, you know, if it's, a, a, you know, a kind of 
a share mis mis selling short fraud run out of New York, uh, say upstate New York somewhere. Most of the victims aren't in New York. Um, the governor of New York doesn't particularly care. Um, you know, he 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 gets elected on what the murder rate is, or or you know what street crime rate is. He doesn't get elected on whether you know someone in Wyoming has been the victim of fraud or not. So it's a real challenge to overcoming the the democratic problem with the fact that most of the victims of these crimes are outside of the jurisdiction which has a, an opportunity to do something about it. This is a big problem, as, as Anders mentioned. The UK is a is I mean I'm I'm slightly. <laughs> I, I, I think the UK already is a big haven for dirty money. I mean, the post-Brexit, where they will become even more so, is alarming. Um, you know, one of the reasons why the UK doesn't do much about this is because we do pretty well out of it. You know, the, the, a lot of money comes here, lots of jobs are created, and all the victims are elsewhere. You know, how do you persuade the British government to do something about that? It's very difficult. And um, that's the challenge we have. And, um, but I feel there is a little bit more progress than there, than there was. Um, you know, in what, two decades ago, in a lot of European countries, a bribe paid overseas was a tax deductible business expense. You know, you could just put it on your tax return, say, yeah, we paid $2 million to the president of Gabon or whatever. You can't do that anymore. Um, you know, we have made progress, but, um, but we, yeah, we have a long way to go. But I mean, um, yeah, transparency is good, but transparency only works if, if, it, if it's coupled with um, realistic and, and firm enforcement to make sure that the laws that are passed are actually obeyed. Oliver, I, I was a little depressed when you wrote about asset recovery. You write that very few assets are ever returned. And you spoke uh, to an FBI agent in a lot of depth. And you said law enforcement basically can't recover these assets because of the electronic nature of money today. Are there any countries that are doing better than others? And what specifically are they doing? Um, uh, yeah, I mean, some countries are, I mean, some countries are doing better than others. And the ones that are doing better are the ones that, that, that are the wealth havens. So the U S the UK, Switzerland, um, but they're still all doing very, very badly. And essentially the problem is a, is a straightforward one, which is, as, as Diane said, you know, if you're a clever lawyer and you're structuring these assets, you put 10 borders between, um, you know, the assets and the law enforcement agency looking for them. In order to get across every one of those borders, the law enforcement agency has to write a letter to their colleagues, occasionally has to go up to the justice ministry, across to another justice ministry, and then down to law enforcement. And then they have to do it again for every single country. Once you've done that for 10 different countries, what, two or three years have gone by, at which point another 10 countries are in the way and you have to do it all over again. It just goes on and on and on. And it's incredibly you know, time consuming and incredibly depressing for law enforcement agents who are, who are engaged in this kind of work. Because, you know, often, um, you know, if you're, you're in Miami and you're working in law enforcement and you're trying to target a building and you know, uh, you know, you're certain in yourself that that building belongs to a, you know, a crook from Venezuela who's stolen a load of money from the state oil company and spent it on a condo in Miami. You know that, but in order to prove that, you have to somehow get around the law enforcement agents in, agencies in, in Miami, in, not just in Miami, in Panama, not just in Panama, in St. Kitts and Nevis, in Venezuela, and gather evidence that can be used in a US court from all of those jurisdictions. And that is incredibly hard. Um, and often it's impossible. You know, and that's for the US, it's impossible. If you're, say, Ukraine and you're trying to re- gather money, if the Ukrainian prosecutors write a letter to St. Kitts and Nevis, they don't even get a reply. You know, so it's some... Um, and I'd also like to add, add to that too, Oliver, is that these 10 jurisdictions you're trying to do business with, most of them are corrupt. You right. can buy the judges, you can buy the cops. So wherever the money has passed through the hands of one or two of these dirty, dirty countries, forget it. It'll go cold. The, the, the path will go, you know, the, the path will go cold. It's, it's, I think that getting back to what I said, I think really we have to deputize the real, the real um, predators here, and that's the legal firm and the accounting firm, and they have to be deputized. They, ha- they have to give up self-regulation. I mean, we had a case in Vancouver where a, a guy let, you know, $30 million go through his legal trust fund to buy real, several pieces of real estate from a woman in China who wasn't even his client. He said, I didn't do anything wrong. She just wanted to use my account. And he didn't collect a fee. It took five years for the Law Society, British Columbia, to get after him. And he didn't even get into trouble. That led to legislation. We went to our parliament to try and correct that, to bridle our lawyers. But who's the parliament full of? Lawyers. Who's Congress full of? Lawyers. 
So this is our problem. We really have to take away self-regulation, also real estate agents and developers. And that's the other thing too, that the US has done, the Treasury Department did very well with luxury properties after I wrote a number of articles about New York and Miami real estate and others did followed as well. And that was anybody buying a very expensive condo, the beneficial ownership had to be known by the developer who sold it to him. That stopped a mm -hmm. lot of it. And also other countries have gone even in an even more draconian way. New Zealand doesn't allow any foreign ownership of real estate, period, because the Chinese were buying the whole place. Vancouver is, has got that partially, a very big foreign property tax on purchase, and they tax people's empty units because what they do is they buy these, these real estate units, they keep them empty. They're, they're, social, they're safety, safety deposits boxes in the sky, like most of Toronto's skyline. And there's nobody in them. So you, if you tax the empty units, you go after the beneficial owners, you, you go after the lawyers, you go after the developers, I think you can stop it. I couldn't agree more. Oliver, I'd like you to, to talk about the, the tools that the rich are using. In your book, you outlined a number of tools. So you talk about uh, the use and invention of the euro bond, and that's still going on. Uh, you talk about the use of shell companies still going on. And then you talk about how people buy passports. Give us an update on that. And then you said people buy diplomatic immunity and they, they make themselves ambassadors. And then uh, you talked a lot about, um, and Anders mentioned this as well, the protection of, of libel. Can you, can you tell us, give us an update on all those different tools? And are, am I missing any other tools that they're using now? Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, it's, a, it's a very entrepreneurial business, the hiding crooks money business. Um, you know, it, it's it's very profitable. There are a lot of very bright people out there thinking all the time of new ways to hide crooks' money. So yeah, they're pushing the frontiers all the time. You know, you the, the you know Parliament or, or Congress thinks they've closed a loophole. You know, without knowing that that eight other loopholes are sitting there just waiting. You know, to be put into into operation because you know they, they, there's so much. Um, innovation happening all the time. I mean, this, yeah, so the, the euro bond issue, and, and I don't want to tell the whole story because it would take ages, but but it's a really interesting example of of the devil making work for idle hands. Um, you know, after the the, the Second World War, uh, the UK, we, you know, the, London had been the financial center of the world. It no longer was because of the very straitened circumstances in which the UK found itself. And you had all these these bankers were sitting around essentially with nothing to do. Um, and, and twiddling their thumbs and looking for ways of, of making a margin. And, and they discovered, essentially, they went into partnership with their colleagues in Switzerland who'd been doing the same thing. And all the money was in Switzerland and the talented bankers were in London and the, the bankers in Switzerland had nothing to do with their money and the bankers in London had no money to do anything with. And they realized that there was a, essentially a, um, you know, a common interest here. So they created this, this, what became called, what they called offshore. And, and offshore is this... Um, was a new invention at the time in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, and, but it was a, um, it's a function of globalization. It's a function of the fact that, that money began to move between countries. And when money moves between countries, but the, but the laws that control or regulate money do not, it means that the owners of that money are able to pick and choose what laws that money obeys. And it's a very simple principle, but, I mean, it, but it's been you know, the fixed point that, is, that has really changed the world. Um, and offshore is not just a, a, um, a concept that applies to money. Um, if you are a, you know, the minister of education from a former Soviet republic and you've looted the, the school system, you don't want your own children to have to go and sit in an empty classroom with no books. You want them to have a perfectly you know, decent education. So you, send, you steal the money and send them off to school in Switzerland or the US or the UK where they can have a good education. Your children are then offshore if you do that. Um, your money's offshore, your children are offshore. But if you want to go and see your children without the indignity of applying for a visa, you can buy a visa. You know, you, 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 you give money to Portugal or Greece or, or what several dozen other countries that will sell you a visa, or the US and the UK and Canada, of course. Um, and, and, and in that case, your, your, your visa is offshore. And in fact, you can buy a passport from, you know, a, well, quite a lot of countries now, five in the Caribbean, four in Europe, and and several other places, which will sell you a passport. In that case, your citizenship is offshore. All of these things are just layers of the concept of offshore, which which build up, which are just ways in which, you know, you were able to use different jurisdictions to to overlay and, and achieve power in your own country. 
And yeah, the final one you mentioned, um, or the final two you mentioned, diplomatic immunity. This is a, it's a niche aspect of offshore, but it's kind of a, it's kind of the, I'd say it's the coming one. Um, because all you need to do is find a country with 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 a desperate need for cash, and and give them some money and and build them a hospital, and they'll make you an ambassador somewhere. The example I have is a a Saudi gentleman called Walid Al Jafali, who no longer is with us, sadly, may he rest in peace, who, who didn't want to pay a decent divorce settlement to his wife. So he had himself made the St. Lucian ambassador to the International Maritime Organization and then claimed diplomatic immunity in the UK. And um, and he kind of got away with it in a funny sort of way. Um, you know, uh, and and I mean, that, you know, is is takes imagination. I mean, I don't think he came up with that scam. Someone came up with that scam. You know, there is somewhere a very innovative entrepreneurial lawyer who came up with that idea. And more, and other people have done it since. The tennis player Boris Becker, uh, he tried to do it as well with, uh, I think, the Central African Republic. It's you know, it's a coming scam. Um, and then, and the final one, that the the really useful one, if you're rich and powerful, um, which is something I notice a lot um, as a journalist here in Britain, is is you can essentially get your reputation offshore. If you establish a reputation as a philanthropist in a major country, then it makes you very difficult to write about. Not so much in the US because there's a protection for freedom of speech, but in the, in the UK, where, where we have very strong defamation laws, if you write about a rich and powerful person who's uh, in Verticom as a philanthropist, um, you know, they will sue you for lessening their reputation. And even if they're not going to win, they will bankrupt you before you even get to court because they can keep fighting and keep bringing in lawyers to fight you all the time. So, you know, essentially, the, the, the cards are stacked in the favor of the rich and powerful all the time. Um, um, and that, yeah, so it's a, it's a real issue. Um, and what, you know, what are the, the, the scams, the new scams, um, that are coming in? I mean, as, as, as both Anders and Diane said that, you know, the, the banks are no way near the problem that they used to be. Um, there's been, you know, some monumental scandals, obviously the Danske bank scandal was, you know, 250 billion euros is, you know, what hundreds of times bigger than the HSBC Mexican drug cartel scandal. I mean, insane amount of money. Um, you know, but that's over, you know, those, the Baltic states appear to be more or less cleaned up, Cyprus to a certain extent cleaned up. I mean, you know, a lot of the worst jurisdictions are are not as bad as they used to be. So where's the money going now? A lot of the money doesn't go into banks at all. You Instead of buying, putting it in electronic form, you buy a physical object. You know, the free ports, um, you buy fine art. You know, you see why there's been this incredible inflation in fine art prices. It's because, you know, fine art is, is an amazing store of value. You know, and you keep it in, in the Freeport in Geneva or in Singapore um, or, or wherever. I mean, the Freeport's all over the place. And um, and it no longer has to touch the financial system. I mean, I was talking to a, a guy the other day, who, who a, a lawyer, who was saying that he has a client who basically doesn't have a bank account. He, he wears expensive watches. He arrives in London, goes into a shop, sells his watch for cash. And there you go. He's got the cash he needs, walks around and leaves. He's, he, he, and, you know, you wouldn't really know he'd been here. And, and that's, a, you know, a, a new way. Way of doing it why bother with electronic money if electronic money is a hassle just use valuable objects one of the most incredible examples you talked about was in china tell us what you found there how are some chinese officials protecting their assets i have to say i'd like to point out this isn't me who found this i, I just stole this i didn't with credit from a from a japanese journalist who did this extraordinary story um of chinese officials who took advantage of the fact that um that the laws on surrogacy for babies are different in china and japan and if and if a, a, a baby is born by a surrogate mother in Japan, the, the surrogate mother is listed as the, as the mother on the birth certificate. So the baby is under Japanese law a Japanese citizen, but even though both biological parents could be from elsewhere, and in this case, both biological parents were powerful, high-ranking members of the Chinese Party or or, or, um, or military. So they would implant uh, an embryo in a um, a Japanese surrogate mother, and then the child would be brought up in a in a in a luxurious children's home in in Japan, and all of the assets are registered in the name of this child, who is, according to Japanese law, an ordinary Japanese infant, but just with millions and millions and millions of dollars in their name. So this is you know this is a walking, talking, living shell company. You know, and I mean you sort of have to wonder what this does to your head to think that to grow up barely knowing any of your family just because you're a living conduit for illicit funds. But but it is. I mean it just goes to show the lengths people will go to to, to um, hide the money. I mean, it should be said, this is a real outlier. Most cases are not, are not that awful. Um, you know, cash will go a long way for, for, for breaking the link between, you know, crime and, and, um, and, and an asset, you know, but this is a, you know, but a, but a, but a, a human shell company will go even further. 
I want to ask you one more question, and then we're going to bring our audience in. What is the London kleptocracy tour? I thought this was clever. You mentioned it in your book. And what we, would we see on it if we got on your bus? And if you well, did the same, same thing in the US, where would it be? It's it. We did one the other day. We're, we, we're lucky in the UK because unlike the US, um, everything is is um, concentrated in London. London is kind of Los Angeles, Washington, New York and Miami all rolled into one. Um, so, it, it you know, it's the big showbiz centre. It's the big wealth centre. It's the political centre. It's everything. So so essentially, if you're a kleptocrat and you want to put money in the UK, it tends to be in London or very near London. So what the kleptocracy tour is, is it's slightly modelled on them. Um, it was the idea, I think, came from Charles Davidson um, from your town. Um, but he, it was put together by my friend Roman Borisovic, who, who lives uh, in Luxembourg now. Um, and it's basically the idea is kind of like a Hollywood bus tour when you drive around and see where, um, you know, Scarlett Johansson buys her lattes or Charlie Chaplin used to go and get his moustache trimmed or whatever. And um, uh, But instead of that, we get to see, you know, where the Russian deputy prime minister lives. We can see, you know, where the you know, son of the president of Egypt has had a house or, or um, you know, the Russian oligarch's place or the Russian senator's place. I mean, you know, uh, you know Isabel dos Santos, the daughter of the former president of Angola, you know, anyone, you name them, they have a house here. Um, you know, Joe Lowe, the, 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 Vic, the, the, cult, the suspect in the biggest theft ever from the Malaysian Sovereign Wealth Fund, um, though he says he's innocent, I should say. Um, you know, they all have properties here. So essentially you put people on a bus and you drive them around and you show them properties and tell them stories. And, and the idea is to, to try and, and bring home to people how offshore is a, is a fiction, right? It, you know, these things might be owned by a company in the British Virgin Islands or, or wherever, but, but that isn't real. These properties are here in the UK and the money that paid for them was real money stolen from real people. So that's the idea. That's what we're trying to achieve. We had one recently uh, about uh, Russian money to highlight the fact that a report into Russian interference in the UK had been oppressed by the government. But um, yeah, we 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 are um, yeah we do them every now and then. They're fun, um, and uh, you know you're all invited. Wonderful, wonderful, um, Diane. I'd like to ask you this question. So if you're listening, uh, please go ahead and type questions in the Q and A box or send us questions on Twitter at AC Eurasia. I think this is a good question for Diane, but Anders and Oliver, if you have thoughts, do jump in. What role does, this is the question from Vinette Sharma. What role does electoral funding play in this as most elections, including US elections are funded from toxic funds from corrupt oligarchs? Well, the, the U.S. has has uh, replicated money laundering techniques in its electoral process through the dark dark pools of capital, the PACs, the secret uh, contributions to people to, to PACs that go into the hands of politicians, that go into Mitch McConnell's hands to divvy out to his members uh, in the Senate, and so on. So it's just really no, no nothing different than the techniques that are that are used that way. Then, of course. They're very, uh, they've been very good at lobbying. Uh, they also um, give money to think tanks. Uh, they also give money to universities, to academic research projects. They fund individual academics who are either Russian or pro-Russian, who get on TV as pundits. Uh, there's many of them. Fox News likes to feature a few of them regularly. Uh, and they're on the payroll. And so that's what they're doing to promote it. And I think that it's, uh, I think that the U.S. electoral process has been so badly tainted that it's either redrawn or it's a democracy, not even in name only. Go ahead, Anders. Thanks, Diane. Yeah, let me continue on this. Uh, I completely agree here with uh, Diane. Uh, what has happened in the U.S. Uh, since uh, the uh, 2010 uh, Supreme Court verdict uh, on Citizens United? is that uh, dark money in all its form is allowed in the U.S. P political campaign financing. And we also have uh, uh, money from uh, Russian oligarchs who are U.S. citizens. The most striking person is Glenn Blavatnik, a partner of uh, Victor Wechselberg and, uh, and uh, Alek Deripaska in uh, Rosal. Russian aluminum uh, company, and they have both been sanctioned. Blavatnik cannot be sanctioned because he's a US uh, citizen, but he's the third biggest owner in uh, Rusal. And he contributed $3.6 million in the last uh, round to uh, Mitch McConnell's leadership fund. 
and $800,000 to Lindsey Graham. This is public and it's uh, completely illegal. And then uh, after Rusal uh, was uh, taken away from sanctioning, uh, he uh, uh, organized the, uh, an investment of Rusal into Kentucky of $200 million. All of this is legal. Uh, something that is not legal is the massive foreign funding of US universities. And of all people, Secretary of Education, Betsy DeVos, uh, has uh, started going after this. And it turns out that, uh, according to her, there is $6.5 billion of unofficial funding that has not been reported as it should to U.S. universities from foreign sources, mainly Chinese and uh, R Russian and Saudi uh, funding. And uh, the universities have just uh, kept quiet about it. So recently we saw a prominent uh, professor at MIT who was uh, arrested for having taken uh, illegal money uh, from China. It remains to be seen whether the case uh, ends up. But what we are seeing in, in the U.S. is a massive uh, penetration, as Diane said, of uh, the, the U.S. Uh, uh, political system. Where I hope that this will end, it is because it's all becoming a national security issue. What is really tough here, it is uh, terrorism financing and sanctions violations. So, for example, in New York recently, it uh, turned out that uh, a skyscraper belonged to sanctioned Iranian sources. And it took quite some time before they figured out, because of a number of uh, anonymous companies, that this skyscraper be belonged uh, to, uh, to, uh, to Iran. So, as soon as something becomes um, uh, 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 a national security interest, it becomes important because we, as uh, uh, Oliver and uh, Diane talked uh, before about it, this uh, secret money abroad, it is uh, all kinds of things. Of course, it's tax evasion, which is the, the least crime, but it means that the illegal billionaires uh, don't pay, uh, pay taxes uh, anywhere. It's terrorist, it's organized crime, it's sanctioned violation, it's ma uh, money laundering, and it's political uh, financing. And uh, today, sanctions, the violation, that's what the, the US Treasury is really going after uh, uh, very badly, and terrorist uh, uh, financing. These are the two worst forms of uh, financing uh, in the view of a, the US Treasury. And then they happen to take the others also. Thanks, Anders. If you're just joining us, now's your chance to get a question in with author Oliver Below. He is the uh, author of Moneyland, the inside story of the crooks and kleptocrats who ru rule the world. I'm sorry, I just gave you the French pronunciation. It's Bolo. I'm so sorry. I have a friend with the last name and he has a French pronunciation. I'm so sorry. I didn't know uh, there I, was a French pronunciation. Uh, very, there yeah. is, there is. Okay, I have a challenge for you from Marta Ferian, uh, um, Oliver. When the US and the UK are the two largest money laundering countries in enablers, what are the chances of so um, we talked about the reform possibilities, but she says, uh, don't these Western countries have no right to lecture or demand other countries about anti-corruption? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's a very good point. I mean, it, it used to be um, that it was the US and the UK and Switzerland um, were the big problems. Um, and then the US lectured Switzerland uh, very verbally and viciously, and Switzerland kind of got squeezed to a certain extent out of the game. So now it's just the US and the UK. Um, so yes, it is a real problem. How do you solve an issue when the biggest bully on the block is, or the you know two of the biggest bullies on the block are, are you know very much responsible for it? Um, this is something I've been writing about recently with regard to South Dakota. Um, which I mentioned earlier, which is now a, you know, a major secrecy jurisdiction, one of the most um, fastest growing and most important. I mean, in the latest secrecy index um, that was published by the Tax Justice Network in the, in the spring, um, the United States has now overtaken Switzerland. It's now second only to the Cayman Islands as a secrecy jurisdiction um, ranked by the Tax Justice Network, and which you know, is, a, is a serious increase in its ranking from fifth a little while ago, and that is a real problem. Um, 
you know, what do you do about that? Well, I mean, as Anders mentioned, there have been some really promising movements in, in Congress to try and tackle this. Um, you know, I think a lot of people recognize that this is not just, uh, you know, anonymous shell companies are not just a convenient way for political donors to be able to avoid taxes. They're also a, a national security threat. If you have, you know, people who mean ill to your nation, and let's face it, a lot of, uh, you know, Chinese, wealthy Chinese people and wealthy Russians do mean ill to the United States. If they're coming over there and buying up parts of your city, buying up strategic uh, companies, you know, what, why are they doing that? Well, you know, what's that about? This is not a kind of risk you want to be taking. And I think a lot of um, an increasingly large number of Congress men and women realize that. And that's very reassuring. Um, so I hope, I'm, I'm hopeful actually that in the next two or three years, there will be major legislative action taken in the US. And once that happens, which I think it will, it will be that, you know, like a light has, has, uh, has switched because then US companies will refuse to accept that they have to abide by these kind of transparency rules and foreign companies don't. And so they will become this big diplomatic presser from the US to, to force other countries to really up their game. So I'm not, I mean, I think the, you know, the US has been, when we, when, when we were talking about, and Diane was talking about how banks are no longer such a problem, one of the main reasons for that, if not the main reason for that, is there have been these massive fines from the DOJ forcing banks, and not just US banks, but forcing uh, HSBC and BNP Paribas and other European banks to really start behaving like responsible corporate citizens. You know, if that same kind of legislative pressure was brought to bear on, on secrecy jurisdictions, this whole problem would be gone in a, in a year. You know, and so that's what I'm hoping for. I mean, it's a, it is a problem. There are some very deep pocketed political donors in the United States who, who, who enjoy the money land system just as much as Mr. Putin does. Um, and their objections will have to be overcome. And that is not easy. Um, but, you know, I'm hopeful that it'll happen. I, I think that, that um, there's a, a line from Winston Churchill, you know, the United States always done, does the right thing once it's exhausted all the other options. And I, and I think that that's, you know, what we can count on right now. Uh, fabulous. A question from Ruel uh, Liebert. He said, it would seem to me to be a good idea for an international conference between nations to coordinate anti-theft standards across borders to reduce paperwork barriers and deter, uh, what was your word for them? Badly behaved? Naughty people. I think that was your word, Oliver. Is it a practical thing to do? Do you think if organized, it can keep up with the crooks and be successful? Well, it's what Anders mentioned earlier about what the European Union is doing. The European Union has very good anti-money laundering directives, which have actually made a real difference. We're up to number five now, and they've really helped standardize uh, regulations and everything. But the problem is that, that the more all countries raise their standards, the more profitable it is to be the one country that doesn't. Um, so, you know, the, it, it's, uh, it's, you know, the higher you build a wall, the more profitable it is to build a tunnel underneath it. Um, so it, it's really difficult to, to enforce these kind of common standards if you don't have diplomatic and financial pressure to bear from the biggest players, and above all, that means the United States. Um, so it, it's it's very hard. I mean, I think, to be honest, you know, it, it, we're not there yet. You know, yet the European Union's done okay, and and some other countries have done okay, but but it, it's we're a long way away from from that kind of that kind of world, sadly. Well, I'm glad you uh, mentioned. Oliver, let me add here that uh, the OECD is now. Uh, uh, working on uh, uh, hindering base erosion uh, in profit sharing, uh, forcing companies to standardize their, uh, their accounts so that it will not be possible to do what uh, Apple has done, for example, moving its uh, profits uh, to, um, to Ireland in that fashion. So the OECD is the very quiet organization in the background that is doing a lot in order to reduce money laundering and uh, uh, to uh, uh, clean up international accounting uh, uh, systems. So here something is being done and here all the big countries are involved. And we also have a fact uh, attached to uh, uh, the OECD, which is uh, the anti-money laundering organization and there even Russia and China are a part and they are playing a board. So this is quite, uh, when I ask people in the US Treasury, why do you accept Russia that is the main money launderer to participate in this? They say, because uh, if Russia and China were not there, they would set up uh, alternative uh, norms. 
no, they, we can influence them so that they accept our no, norms. And there is peer press, uh, pressure and it's a peer review. So while these um, international organizations, the power should not be uh, overestimated, but they are gradually digging into this. And another thing we have not mentioned is the geographic target orders in the US that have to very considerable extent cleaned out the real estate sector. And uh, I think Diane mentioned it before, you simply need to uh, 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 inform the title uh, <clears throat> agency who is the ultimate beneficiary owner. After this was introduced uh, on a limited scale in 2016, the anonymous owners of uh, 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 real estate in the US has sharply fallen because they don't want to go through that process and they are afraid that it will apply also where it does not. So as Diane mentioned, Canada is now the favored place to buy real estate. So money launderer, go to Canada and not to the US. That would be my recommendation. Yeah. Thanks, Anders. I've, I've got a question from Aubrey Belford. Uh, this is for uh, Diane and Oliver. What effect do you think the coronavirus pandemic will have on illicit money flows? For example, it's uh, likely pretty hard to turn drug cash into clean money right now. What about kleptocratic money? Have you seen anything concrete yet? It's a really interesting point. Um, I think it's difficult to be a, a criminal at the moment, but um, <laughs> there are always opportunities, um, you know, for fraudsters, for example, there's a lot of anxious, vulnerable people out there. So, you know, I, I think that, that, you know, they're, you know, criminals are nothing if not entrepreneurial. So I think that they will be finding ways of, of getting around this issue. Interesting, what I'm writing about at the moment is, this is actually a serious problem for kleptocrats in that they're quite used to coming and getting their health care in the UK or Germany, um, you know, and suddenly they're having to rely on hospitals in their own countries. And this is really a, an, an uncomfortable place for them to be. So, um, so you know, it, it's a, I think kleptocrats are suffering too. So, you know, hope some thoughts and prayers. Thanks a lot. No, I think that uh, the, the days of physical transportation of cash to launder it, you know, are, is long gone. It's all done by keystroke now. So there's no reason that it would be slowed or changed. I don't know. I mean, well, maybe maybe on your hemisphere, but in London, we're, we're behind the times. We still like, we, you know, cash is still king over here. A bag of cash coming into Heathrow still goes a long way. Well, thank you so very much. We have uh, a ton of very interesting questions, but unfortunately, I'm told we must cut it off. So, Oliver, we'd love to have you back. Thank you, Diane. Thank you, Anders, for being fabulous panelists. Oliver's next book is going to be called something like Butler Britain or Butler to the World. His uh, 2018 book is Moneyland, and I encourage you to read it. Thank you so much for joining us, and see you, uh, see you again next time. There you go. Show us the cover one more time, Oliver. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks, guys. It was our pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.